I have I am going to kick off and introduce our first plenary, our AM plenary. Um, it is called How to Feed the Resistance. And we are so fortunate to have such a dynamic, dynamic um, set of panelists and speakers. I'm really looking forward to hearing everyone's journey and story. Um, we have, um, the moderator will be Julia Tertian. She is the author of Feed the Resistance. She is a cookbook author and writer. No, give it up. <laughs> Get into this plenary. <laughs> She, she recently wrote this cookbook, Feed the Resistance, combining two topics um, as a guide for activists, um, recipes and ideas for getting involved. It's part cookbook and part guide for inspiring change. And it brought together uh, 25 chefs and writers from across the country to share their wisdom. We, again, are fortunate not to just have her, but we have three of the contributors to that book. We have Von Diaz, um, a writer and producer and author of Coconuts and Collards. Oh, stories and recipes from Puerto Rico to the Deep South, I'm sorry. Um, we have Davida, straight from Detroit, um, the executive director of Food Lab Detroit. We have um, Hawa Hassan, the CEO of, of Bas Bas Sauce. Okay. <laughs> um, Jordan Lexton, the CEO of Drive Change. So I'm lifting up their names. I'm glad that you're giving them a warm response. I want you to give them an even warmer response as they come up to the stage and take their seats. But we're going to get this started. Get into this plenary, for real. Uh, thank you to Just Food and to Kiana for, for having us all here. Um, thank you to Ms. DeVito Davison for bringing this panel together um, and, and for that was yeah. for arriving. Thank you, you have for arrived. saying yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so as Kiana mentioned, my name is Julia Tertian. Um, for anyone I don't know, I put together this book, Feed the Resistance, which came out in, um, in October. And the way I like to describe it is it's a little book with a lot in it. I had a copy and I gave it away, <laughs> so I can't show it to you right now. Um, but the book is full of uh, recipes and essays and list of resources. It's all ways to get involved. Um, so sort of literal and figurative recipes, all things to kind of cook up action, if you will. And the book features over 20 contributors. I'm joined by four of them today, all extraordinary. You're going to hear more from them soon. And all the proceeds from the book go uh, directly to the ACLU. So by purchasing the book, uh, you know, readers, just by nature of doing that, support the protection of civil liberties. Um, Kiana asked me to reflect briefly on what inspired me to put together the book. And I was really thrilled to see um, the opening statement for, uh, for today. Um, the um, the conference statement. I'm sorry, and it's actually when you open your um, your booklet, it's on the first page in the cover. And again, you don't have to read it now, but you can <laughs> or or read it later. But it really mirrored my my inspiration to put together Feed the Resistance, um, which for me, my version of that statement is that we are uh, living in a very particular moment in time, uh, and I wanted to contribute something positive and productive to the conversation. And I wanted that contribution to come from an intersectional community of people, uh, people both in and around food, because we all have food in common. Uh, together, we could use the familiar medium of a cookbook to connect with readers, uh, to introduce them to all the various ways we all, everyone in this room, uses food as a tool for justice. Um, we could even use the book to introduce readers to ourselves, because as everyone who sits with me here this morning, does, we all bring our full selves to our work. And in doing so, we make the landscape of food more dynamic and diverse and forward moving and just. Um, so with that in mind, I would love if you could each introduce yourselves. We heard a little bit about who you all are, but if you could just speak briefly about who you are and what you do, sort of like a little verbal business card. Yeah. Uh, really quickly, um, I am so glad to be here. Um, this, this conference always feels like home for me. Um, for the last five years or six years running, I've never missed a Just Food conference. So I truly feel like I am at home when I am here, all the way from Detroit, Michigan. Um, this, is, this, is, this, is, this is home. 
Um, and so my name is Davida Davison, and I am the executive director of Food Lab Detroit. And real quickly, just my, my 30 second pitch is that at Food Lab Detroit, we really sit at the intersection of food, economic justice, and movement building. Because what we do at Food Lab Detroit is that we work with, we train, we incubate, and we accelerate food entrepreneurs who look like me, who look like you, young people, old people, people of color who show up as their full selves. And we do that because we believe that business, particularly food businesses, can be used as a weapon for change. When folks in communities, yeah. I don't, I don't know about y'all um, in, in New York, but you know, Detroit is quickly, uh, <laughs> in some neighborhoods, Detroit is quickly gentrifying in some communities. And it's important to us in Detroit that we not only have homes that are owned by folks of color and the long-standing residents, but it's also important for us that we own businesses too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we do at Food Lab, is that we work with folks to own businesses in their community. <laughs> yeah. We're hyped yeah. this morning. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. That was great. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, hey, everybody. My name is Jordan Lexton. I am the CEO and founder of an organization here in New York called Drive Change. Um, so we have two goals as an organization. The first goal is to build access to opportunity, particular employment opportunity for young returning citizens, individuals between 18 and 25 who are coming home from jail. Uh, and the second goal is to use food and hospitality as a tool to raise awareness about injustice inside of our systems and build community. So I was a teacher on Rikers Island for three years. My background into this work comes through the lens of witnessing how racist, classist, destructive our current criminal justice system is and that it is intentionally designed uh, to be as it is. Um, there is a public high school inside of Rikers Island because so many teenagers in our city are incarcerated and not just incarcerated, they're incarcerated as adults. New York is one of two states that still treats 16 year olds like adults automatically in the criminal justice system. While we've made some strides to raise the age, that is abominable. Uh, and I'm a New Yorker, I grew up here, so that's completely unacceptable to me as a New Yorker. Um, uh, and also, when I was teaching inside of Rikers, one of the only places where we uh, showed love, trust, respect, um, human dignity was inside of a culinary arts class. Now, I was a teacher, I was an English teacher, not a culinary instructor, but witnessing, and, and like was just said, the, the tool and the, the way in which business can be a platform for providing people with, uh, with, with, with economic stability and also can be used as a tool to teach, not just professional skills, but social and emotional skills as well. Businesses and, and societies are just people making decisions. So we have a, we have a choice in how they look, how they form, how they interact. Drive Change started by, um, uh, we started a food truck business where we uh, employ young adults coming home from the system and then use the platform of that business to teach these transferable skills in a year long fellowship. Being mobile helps us get out in the community, connect and raise awareness around some of these issues. I'm so happy to be here in this space. We've got three new really exciting programs that I can't wait to talk to you guys about. And just to be alongside these people on this panel, it's a beautiful thing. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Woo! Hi. Hey, good morning, y'all. Um, I am not the director of a nonprofit um, <laughs> in any capacity. Um, I, so my name is Vaughn Diaz, and I am a writer and radio producer based here in New York. I was born in Puerto Rico but raised in the South and am the author of a brand new cookbook that came out this week uh, that's actually a culinary memoir <laughs> called um, Coconuts and Collards. Um, and if I get a chance, I'll scoot over there and grab a copy so you can see what it looks like. <laughs> um, a, I do want to say that um, I'm also so delighted and honored to be on this panel 
uh, early in my life, I was completely dedicated in my career to social justice work, particularly around women and children, um, particularly women who had experienced uh, domestic violence and sexual assault. And uh, my life sort of transitioned in a lot of different ways towards becoming a journalist and a writer who instead of providing direct services, um, I would say I, it uses storytelling as a mode of social justice and as a way to advocate for people's rights. And um, in many ways, my the book that I wrote came as a result and as a direct consequence of being in community with incredible women who'd survived a lot in their lives and gave me an opportunity to lift up the women in my life who had done the same. So I look forward to hearing from all of y'all on this panel and talking a little bit more about it. Thank you. Woo. Good morning. Can you guys hear me? Is this on? It's yeah. on, right? Yeah, I think so. Um, my name is Hawa Hassan. I am born in Somalia and raised in Nairobi, Kenya. Um, I moved to Seattle, Washington after spending some time in a refugee camp in Kenya. Um, kind of got myself through Seattle, raised myself in America, moved to New York around 2005. And when I was growing up in Seattle, there weren't many people who looked like me. But when I came to New York City, I feel like I found a pocket for myself. And as I got older, I realized people were always telling me who I was and where I was from. And in order to control that narrative, I decided to start a food business called Best Best. Best Best is a line of Somali condiments right now, which we're hoping to grow into a pantry of African foods. Mm -hmm. um, we're in grocery stores like Whole Foods and Dean and DeLuca. I wanted to be able to tell our stories from a healthy perspective. We are a prosperous country. We're not an asshole continent. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm so delighted to be here. These people on this panel, for me, are food heroes of mine. They've become a community in some way. And I'm so excited to be able to chat with you all today. Um, thank you. Thank you all so much. Um, you all do such, we all do such different um, work, but it's all very impactful. And I think so many people in this room share that today. We're really, I feel like we're sitting in a room of action. Um, I'm sure this is the first time for many people they've sat still for this long. Um, and I wanted to, you know, with this in mind that so many people here are working towards so many good things, I wanted to center uh, my questions today for, for everyone on this idea of, of persistence, on the persist part of resist. And I wanted to talk about um, basically stamina and, and support and how we all continue to push forward in our work and our very different work, um, even when obstacles you know, come our way as, as, as they do. Um, and I also wanted to talk about ways in which we support each other. Um, and just for a little forecast, I'm, I'm planning to ask some questions, but then we'll open it up um, at the end you know, for some questions too. So if, if there's anything on your mind that I don't get to, please um, come ask us at the end. Um, so I would like to start, if you could maybe just all uh, briefly answer, because this was a question that came up for me a lot, um, not actually when I was putting together the book and talking to all of you, but after it came out, I was asked by a lot of people, what is the resistance? And what are we resisting? And I'm wondering how you each define that, whether it's in your professional capacity or on a personal level, what does your resistance look like? And you can go in any order. Yeah, I'll, I'll start. Um, and so I, I want to, I think I'm very clear on what my resistance mm -hmm. looks like. And my resistance looks like the dismantling and the usurping of white supremacy. I mean, that's just, that's just point blank. What it is. And, and the reason why I say that is because there is this genius of a man who I absolutely adore and admire, and his name is Brian Stevenson. Mm -hmm. And if you haven't seen Brian's um, um, talk, TED Talk, please, please, please um, do yourself a favor and watch it. But one of the things that Brian says that resonates with me as an African-American woman who was a descendant of slaves, he said that slavery was not the most unjust Slavery was not most the vicious. Slavery was not most the, the, the most horrifying thing that happened in this country, the enslavement of hundreds of years of, of black bodies. He said what the most vicious thing was, it was the invention of race and white supremacy that justified slavery in the first place. 
And so it is important to me in my work and what I do is to dismantle white supremacy. And I use business as a tool to do that. And real quickly, why it is so important and why we must persist is because we have to know our history. And as an African-American woman who is very conscious, or as the young folks say, woke, <laughs> I, I completely understand my history. I understand that there is a trajectory that every time black people in this country make two steps forward, white supremacy raises its ugly head and pushes us five steps backwards. I'm aware of that. I know that after slavery, we went through a reconstruction period. And I know as a response to reconstruction, there was something that was called Jim Crow. And as a response to Jim Crow, there was something that was called the Civil Rights Act. And as a response to the Civil Rights, Civil Rights Act, there was something that's called mass incarceration, the okay. evolution of slavery. Mm -hmm. We have to persist. We have to. We cannot let up. We have to keep forward. Because if we do not, then what will happen to the next generation? And so that's the reason why I do what I do. My brother just had a baby, and I have a two-year-old niece. And the baton will be passed mm -hmm. to her. And I was so proud of the young people that marched yesterday all over this country. And, and I'll just say in closing to my young people, it's y'all time. Yeah. It's y'all time. Yeah. It is y'all's time. It is y'all's time. So I just stand in solidarity with the young people and look forward to you all leading in the future. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what what to be to um, say? Yeah. Um, your heart your heart act to follow. <laughs> yeah. I, so we at Drive Change we do something called uh, six word bios, mm -hmm. um, and my six word bio is not cut out for the sidelines. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I was an athlete my whole life, so I took a little bit of the sports analogy, putting it into also just like the 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 challenge energy inside of me. Um, uh, you know, I think also too, quite honestly, as a queer person, like I have to reimagine a world for my own existence to be something that mm -hmm. is possible. So um, uh, when it comes to thinking about things differently or creatively, uh, that's my nature. Uh, um, I, 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 don't, I don't have a choice and then also I'm, I love that I don't have a choice. I think that, that uh, being able in some ways to think about business creatively, to think about uh, our power dynamics, white supremacy, the structures of racism, and what we've, as a, nat as, a, as a nation, as a civilization, created, you learn that you can uncreate it. Um, what the young people were saying at the beginning about, about sci-fi, I think, is right. Like, yeah. you don't, you, you know, when, in, in, in a business, when you're thinking about what you want your business to be, you do visioning. Right, you like think about what do I want this to be? <laughs> Literally, it's li what you do, and then you make choices and you adapt and you iterate to get closer to those goals. And those goals stem from a feeling, uh, and a feeling and understanding of like what creative energy is and what you want for yourself, for your family, for your community, and for others. And so I think just really. Um, uh, by by nature of doing that work for for internally, uh, and then recognizing that if something is constructed, it can be reimagined, um, is what is what the resistance is about for me. This is a tough question, Julia. Um, <laughs> You know, so many of our feminist godmothers um, made, uh, paved a way for mm. the idea that sharing your personal story, particularly when you come from a marginalized community, is an act of resistance. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. in doing so, you're filling in the gaps left by other people's narratives and other people's prioritization of white narratives over that of people of color. And my resistance because of that remains, I would say, hyper-local. Mm -hmm. um, I focus on my um, the people from my island because I know Puerto Rico best for me. Mm -hmm. And I understand the experience there from my own perspective and from having 
been there. And, um, and so I will continue to resist by lifting up the people from my island, mm -hmm. by using my little book as a platform to showcase the beauty of that place and what might be um, when we recover yet again. Mm -hmm. mm. Amen. Beautiful. So beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I resist by showing up fully as myself to everything that I do every single day. Yeah. Um, and I don't do it when it's only affecting Somali refugees and immigrants. Mm -hmm. I do it when it's affecting um, all marginalized communities, my LGBTQ friends. I mean, as a Muslim girl, to be able to march with my friends and to be able to have that conversation with my mom, for us has even built a bridge between us and her lack of understanding of other people and where they come from and why they've made the choices that they've made or why they were born a certain way. Um, I also resist by providing aid. Like, I have a good network of friends, so I fundraise. We provide tampons and pads to marginalized communities, um, to the community that I belong to and have come from. So, yeah, I think that a lot of people walk around feeling like, um, especially now when it's so cool to be woke, <laughs> um, that you have a choice. We, none of us in this room should feel like we have a choice, and we don't have a choice. So if you're not resisting, and if you're not waking up every day trying to persist, I encourage you to get some, some I encourage you to get real about what's happening. Yep. Right. Um, and take a hard look at yourselves and figure out how can you um, resist, and how can you fully show up. That's right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, how are you talk? a little bit about um, the bridge between you and your and your mother. And I wanted to ask about another bridge that I know is part of your work, which is mentorship. Mm -hmm. And um, and thinking about sort of obstacles that can come up, you know, getting a food product from idea to bottle on a shelf mm -hmm. is not a quick and easy process, as I think a lot of people here know. And I was wondering if you could reflect a little bit on, um, yeah, the role of mentorship in your work and, and how that's come into, into Best Best. Yeah, um, so I'm close with a woman that maybe some of you all know um, called Beth from Beth's Farm Kitchen. They're actually a sponsor of Just Food today. She brought me here two years ago as her guest. Um, and I met Beth from Googling and being online when I was first starting Best Best. Um, Beth has taken me under her wing, but over the years, our, our relationship has developed into one of friend, friendship. Um, she's somebody that I pray with. She's somebody that I laugh with. She's somebody that I get coffee with every Friday. Um, you know, it hasn't been, I think that oftentimes when people tell you about mentors, they tell you about that one hour a month, that phone call, that you have to do it. Um, this has been a Beth gets a lot from me. I get a lot from Beth relationship. Um, it's been more than just work. It's been an exchange of our our time, our lives, our families. I know her husband, Charlie, really well. Um, so as much as I like to say that Beth, that Best Best is you know, my baby, I think that one of the things that's really helped me to be very successful in this space is having to be able to share my child with people like Beth, because mm -hmm. she, she counts Best Best as her own as well. So to have a 70-something-year-old lady from you know, Chicago by way of Connecticut, push around a Somali condiment mm -hmm. only furthers the dismantling of the narrative, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so yeah, I don't know if that answers your question, yeah. but it's not been traditional. And I don't think any relationship you have should be in a box. It should be messy. Our, our friendship and mentorship has been, it's been a lot. It's been messy. It's been 4 a.m.s. It's been me borrowing her car to deliver to, you know, Whole Foods. It's been, her making my condiments. Um, so yeah, I, I, if you're gonna take people under your wing, I would say do it with the intention of that it's gonna be more than a boxed relationship. Um, and, and Vaughn, you touched on this a bit, and I wanted to, the sort of theme of, of persistence and pushing through. Um, so cookbooks uh, take a long time to make. Um, when you started working on your book, uh, Puerto Rico is in a much different state than it is now. Yeah. Your book came out la this past week. Yes. Woo! Which is one, yeah, one more time. 
I highly, highly recommend it. The uh, coconut milk braised collards are amazing. Um, but I wanted to ask uh, specifically the impact of, of the hurricanes, um, you know, not just on the island, but for you personally, how did that shift your work? Did, um, did it mean adding anything to your book? Did it reframe what the book means to you, what it means to your family? How, how did the hurricanes come in? Um, I mean, it's ongoing, right? Um, the, the, the future of the island, I think, for all of us, either on the island or, or here on the mainland, still feels really unclear. Um, the last statistic that I saw in the Washington Post was that as of two weeks ago, nearly a million people are without power on the island. And um, uh, so I believe that final edits to my cookbook were due at the beginning of Oct and beginning end of October and Maria hit in September um, of this last fall. And I immediately wrote to my publisher and said, I know that we're really running at the edge here, but if I don't write a postscript for this book, it won't feel right to me. I won't be able to promote it in its current state. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so they did give me the opportunity to write um, just a few words to acknowledge that at the moment that the book was being published, I had not heard from anyone. Mm -hmm. I hadn't heard from any of my loved ones. I didn't, I didn't know where they were. I was fairly confident that they were okay. Um, I'm lucky that I have some really strong people in my family who um, were living in places where I felt like they could get aid. But at the moment that I was writing it, I didn't know where they were or what state they were in. And I started to get, um, I had these text messages that I had received in the hours before the storm hit from one of my colleagues and good friends, Cruz Ortiz Cuadra, who's an incredible Puerto Rican food historian. And, um, and I, I should have brought the book up so I could read from it. But ultimately, the last word I heard from him was, um, this is hell and devastation, and then radio silence for days. So it was, it was very, very frightening for a lot of us. Um, and so um, I have, a few things I think have changed for me. One is that I've been tr keeping track of everyone there very differently than I did in the past. Um, if you get a chance to, to check out the book, which is again, Coconuts and Collards, um, a lot of the final chapter is dedicated to this incredible chef who has a little restaurant in his community in Yabucoa, which is up in the mountains on the southeast corner of the island and happens to be where the eye of the storm hit. Mm -hmm. And he, of all people, was someone who I, I had a very hard time reaching. Um, and just this past week, he sent me a video of what his restaurant looks like now, and it's ju it's just gone. It's completely gone. And his community has been without power since Irma. Yeah. So that's August. Um, he is spending 15 to $20 a day on generator electricity for his restaurant. He's spending upwards of $25 a day on electricity for his home and for his family. And I just have absolutely no idea how they're affording it. I don't know how anyone is managing in these circumstances. Um, and so I feel like a, a couple of things have changed. Um, I think when I, when I wrote the book, it felt like a celebration. Mm -hmm. and, and now it feels a little bit more like a, like a platform for showing um, and maybe reflecting on um, of all of what, all of the problems that have already been in Puerto Rico, mm -hmm. food inequity, mm -hmm. um, racism, uh, economic insecurity, which are things that my family experienced mm -hmm. that are now sort of very elevated in Puerto Rico in a way that's um, that's really intense. Um, I also, I think, s in a in a very kind of spiritual way, have started to celebrate the food of my island differently. Mm -hmm. um, I recently had the opportunity to um, uh, speak um, with the host from NPR for Weekend Edition about how I honor. Puerto Rican food differently. And um, I was making a stock the other day and found that I had this container of rock salt that is from um, Cabo Rojo, which is on the southwest um, tip of the island. There's a, a historic natural salt flat that's there that's really beautiful, and you can buy salt from there. Um, and I, I hadn't looked at that container in a while and, and suddenly sort of felt like this is, this is what I make all my mm -hmm. stocks with until it's done, and then mm -hmm. I'll go back to the island and mm -hmm. get more of that salt. And so, I mean, that's sort of a very personal thing, but a way that I am speaking to my island mm -hmm. differently than I had when I started. Wow. Amazing. Thank you. I feel like there's such a beautiful, um, there's something between what Hawa does and what you do with your yeah, salt absolutely. and having these foods be part of, um, you know, literally in your food, in your body, you know, putting a place on your plate. Um, 
Jordan, when I think of drive change, I mean, persistence is, is drive change. <laughs> um, and your work, I think, so often is up against a criminal justice system that, uh, you know, it's not just broken, it was never built with compassion. And I'm wondering this, this idea of, of um, resistance mixed with persistence, how, how do you persist in continuing to drive change when you're up against that? Yeah, I mean, um, I think it, first and foremost, there's no other option. Mm -hmm. So uh, just somewhere I know that. Mm -hmm. um, and that doesn't mean that it always is gonna be about drive change. You know, I think like mm. the reality is that um, uh, building organizations, building companies, that's hard, it's hard work. Mm -hmm. uh, there absolutely have been times in the history of building drive change where um, I felt myself tired and burnt out and like really, really exhausted uh, personally. And, and, and there was, you know, there, there was actually just about a year ago for a period of time, I was the only full-time staff mm -hmm. member at Drive mm -hmm. Change. Um, uh, and uh, yet at the same time, one of the things that we say uh, with the, within the organization is that what we're trying to do is not just build access to opportunities, but provide people with the skills, confidence, and support that they need to actually sustain those opportunities once they're achieved. Mm -hmm. um, and so that doesn't just go for the young people coming home from jail that we work with, that goes for everyone. And I think we take the same values and approach that we, that we do with our young people and we apply it to our staff, to our community. Uh, because you know, when you think about it, like everybody needs support. Everyone does. Um, in order to sustain these movements, we need to rely on our communities. We need to understand that it, we're not isolated. Mm -hmm. And the more that you can you know, talk about things vulnerably, talk about areas that are really challenging, get the, get the, the actual uh, things you need in order to make the impact that you know that you can make, it's necessary. Mm -hmm. you know, we, like, we need financial resources mm -hmm. to do this work. Uh, we need people to show up to do this work. We need cross-sector, public, private government to come together to do this work. Dismantling our power structures is challenging. Mm -hmm. And you know why it's challenging is because the people who have power are the people we're trying to take down. Mm -hmm. So in reality, like, mm -hmm. you know, somebody, my, one of my mentors said to me, you know, leaders are in conflict. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. just, you know, that's just the way it is. Like leaders are in conflict. Mm -hmm. So you got to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and, and then you need to take care of yourself and others. Mm -hmm. And you need to find the people that are going to be able to, to, to step up with you. Because I think also, too, one thing that is really, really cool uh, is that there is real? I've seen by growing drive change over the last five years, by you know the personal things in my own life as well, that um, that there is real truth to the power of narrative and numbers. Mm -hmm. So when I when I say narrative, I mean that like five years ago. Uh, so I left teaching on Rikers Island in 2012. I was there for three years, and when I left in 2012. You know, everyone, I, t I, I just was like, we need, to get out, we need to get out there and we need to talk about these issues. No one knows what's going on inside of Rikers Island. It is an atrocious, horrible place. And like, I grew up on the Upper East Side of Manhattan where people had access to opportunity. Like, like you know, they walked out the door and they fell into a new, uh, new job. Like, <laughs> um, and so, you know, uh, uh, and yet a mile and a half away in, um, in a store off of Astoria in, in Hazen, off East Hazen, there's Rikers Island. And the, the, the story is a completely different story. And 80% and of the people there are pre-trial detainees who just cannot afford bail. Mm -hmm. And it costs 257, 257, wait, 257,000, is that how you say that? Yeah. yeah, that amount of money <laughs> is what it costs <laughs> to incarcerate a single person inside of Rikers wow. for one year. If we think about redistrib redistribution of wealth and redistribution of that, of that money, like think, just think about that. Like that, that is, uh, and, and people needed to know that. Mm -hmm. So, at, what, I, what I think we have seen, though, even within the last five years, is you know, uh, there's been a shifting narrative around criminal justice reform. I think people are not just talking about it, though, from a fiscal lens, which you know, that's one argument. But we're able to say, like, this is white supremacy. This is structural racism. This is mass incarceration. Is the grandparent, or sorry, grandchild of slavery like people are able to say that out loud and 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 really understand that that is 
truth. And so that's the, the and, and one of the things that we've done specifically is we've stopped using language that's not people forward. Yes. So returning citizens, formerly incarcerated, these are people, people forward words that you can now use, returning citizen only when you refer to a person who's been incarcerated. So just doing that, right, we've seen the narrative, pushing that narrative, change people's feelings change you know, the stigma that is potentially associated with someone who's been impacted. Uh, and it comes from voice, and it comes from narrative. And the same thing is true like in my own personal life. You know, I started using gender neutral pronouns. That's not easy to do. But the more and more that I do it, the more and more that I make sure that other people around me understand that that's who I am and start to use that language around me, the more it becomes my daily existence. It's just pattern, habit, persistence. That's what happens. So, uh, you know, the same thing then, I said numbers, and I think numbers really matter. You know, when, when it's one person that's saying it out loud on a street, you know, the person who's like telling you the wor world is gonna end, yeah, it looks a little strange. You walk, oh, you go, oh, yeah, I walk your head, you know. <laughs> when, when it's hundreds and thousands and millions of people marching in DC because they're getting shot up in school, all of a sudden, you know what? It's not so it's not so wild anymore. So the real reality of numbers, the power is in the people. And when people step up and recognize that we have the opportunity to make our voices heard, we there I think one statistic I saw is that the NRA, I'm using this as an analogy, but the NRA has like four million uh, members and Generation Z has sixty-nine million people. So just you know, if I when I think about persistence and when I think about, you know, some of the things, the, the, the ebbs and flows of, of this stuff, it's, it's, it's just, uh, it's in us to recognize that narrative and numbers matter. Um, putting people around you that are going to lift you up so that you can do this work not in isolation because no one gets anything done alone. And actually, I just want to take a moment to ask the people from Drive Change to just stand up for a second. Yes. So, um, uh, this is... So this is Kirk. Kirk, just raise your hand. That's Kirk, so you can talk to Kirk about Drive Change. After, and that's Cerise, you can talk to Cerise as well. And Jen is up there uh, too. I think we may have a couple other people around as well, but um, uh, we're, we're like Oh, hey, Whitney's here also, that's great. So. And, 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 you know, it's not just the people at Drive Change. I mean, there's somebody here uh, whose name is Nick who runs um, the Randalls Island Urban Farm. So we get produce donated to us from Randalls Island Urban Farm. Um, that's what makes it happen, too. Nick's right there, actually. So you can see Nick is right there. Uh, and there are people um, like Nikki who works at Seedco who's doing this work as well and talking about how do we change the, uh, Nikki, you can, you can raise your hand also too. That's Nikki too. Hey. Doesn't work for Drive Change but works for an organization that's working on shifting the narrative inside of food and hospitality spaces around racial and economic justice um, because, you know, we have to make sure that the people in power are getting the framework and the lens to make people forward workspaces mm -hmm. where humans can be their whole selves at work. Mm -hmm. So it does not happen just with Drive Change alone. It certainly doesn't happen with me. Uh, it is a community effort and that's my stamina. That's how, that's how it happens. Thank you. Wow. I love the, um, the drive change surround sound. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it's amazing.